What's up, everybody? Uh, my name's Greg Matus, uh, and I'm also known as Dutch, but I'm not from the Netherlands. Um, that was a name I got when I was a kid growing up um, in Western Pennsylvania. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about uh, some new developments that are going on with um, these online universities that are coming out um, and how Python's being used. Um, so I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so just a little disclaimer, this talk's gonna be a little bit more informal. Um, it's, it's, it's not so much focused on the technology, it's more focused on some of the bigger, qu big picture questions that you may think about when you're talking about education, when you're talking about, you know, how we make, uh, how we develop our educational system, um, and what sort of motivates that. Um, so, uh, let's dig in. Looking at a little bit of the history of online education and online learning, you know, of course, there's the big daddy, Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is really at this online encyclopedia that just has a huge amount of information. Um, and you can go out there and look up whatever information you want, but it's a little passive. You've got to sort of search for what you want. So it's good for self-motivated learners. Um, and also the information there, you know, if you're just diving into something, it can be a little, you know, advanced, particularly if you're trying to learn things like mathematics and science. And you've probably noticed that. Then along comes this guy, you know, Khan, and he creates this Khan Academy. And what Khan Academy is really is a bunch of videos where he goes through the lectures, he, he draws on the board, you know, this virtual board, and he kind of leads you through the thought process of how you come about understanding it. Um, and that led to, you know, a little bit of revolution in how people thought about education. You know, and so they started to think, how can we apply this, you know, in the classroom? And they came up with this idea of, you know, maybe this inverted classroom where, you know, you actually watch the lectures on your own time and you come in the classroom and you do your homework and the teacher helps you with your homework. So there's been sort of this, you know, some experimentation and, and some progression in how we, how we take these, this new technology um, and apply it to traditional or, or classical classroom settings. Okay, now, you know, fairly recently we have this thing of online universities. Um, so there's several of these organizations have cropped up now. We have Coursera, we have Udacity, you know. So what, what they are is they're, they're trying to kind of bridge this gap between very informal, you know, online lectures and, and the full-fledged classroom experience that you might get. So they actually have real professors out there from you know, your, your top tier universities that are actually out there and, and recording these lectures. Um, they use videos, they use uh, these quick quiz format. So what they'll do is they'll go through a concept um, and spend a few, a few minutes explaining the concept. Then they'll quiz you to ask, to see if you're really picking up on that concept. So it's a very quick feedback rather than sitting through a lecture where you spend an hour and maybe it's all going over your head now you really know right away, hey, I, this is, you know, I'm not getting this or whatever. So you get immediate feedback, you know, to you. Um, uh, now they have a little bit of an ambiguous relationship to the real universities. So these obviously aren't real universities, but they're using university professors. So that, that whole thing is kind of have to be worked out. Um, but obviously professors are interested in this because they can reach a much bigger audience. Um, so, that's, that's where we are today. So, the, the university that I was really looking at, and I took a couple courses there, was Udacity. Um, and they use Python, as well as Coursera uses Python, um, in their courses. So, they have a comp computer science courses where they use Python, but they also, in their other courses, like their math courses, um, they use Python as well to help illustrate the concepts. So I'll go run through a little demo right now and show you a little bit how that works um, if you haven't seen that. Um, so, let's see here. 
So this is kind of an example. The, the, this is Coursera, or sorry, this is Udacity. Um, there's these videos that you watch, um, and when you reach the end of the video, there's a question and then you have to answer. So this is an example where uh, this was actually taught by Professor Thrun, who's actually founded Udacity, and he's explaining the central limit theorem for statistics. Um, so he's going to go through, let me see, where are we? Um, okay, so what he's going to do here is he's going to talk about a little bit about the central limit theorem and how you come about it. Um, and then he's going to set up a problem where he wants you to s sort of illustrate the central limit theorem using Python. So I'm going to kind of zoom through till, till, to get to the, the Python part. Um, so the first exercise, he's going to simulate, you know, flipping a coin, you know, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, and you, you get the fairly obvious result of, uh, you know, the average of getting heads is, is 50%. Um, so here's kind of this, this console that comes up where I've already, I've already done this exercise, but what he would do was he would stub out um, what these, these methods that he wants you to fill in and then the what he wants you to call at the end. And when you, s when you run that and submit it, then he checks really what the output is, or the, the software checks what the output is and compares it to what's expected. So, so it's really result-oriented in that um, it's checking that you get the correct answer. It's not checking the quality of your code. Obviously, you could write garbage code and get the right answer. That's okay. Um, so, so you can run this right in your browser. Um, and you, and you get a result. Um, and this is a full-fledged, you know, Python environment. So I can do things like if I wanted to, um, um, See, if, if I run this, I can see it's, it's running on Red Hat, you know, and it's version 2.6.6 of, of Python. Um, so the, the significance, so if I submit this, um, I, I've just run it, I can run it any number of times. If I submit it, it's actually going to check to see that I got the result. Um, and, if I, and if I did this, this wrong and got the right, wrong answer, it would tell me I'm wrong and I'd have to try again. Um, so what it does is it gives you that immediate feedback um, that what you're doing, you know, is what's expected. And it helps also illustrate the concepts. So in this class, the Python programming is actually optional. You don't have to do it. You can do the whole class without doing any Python, um, but it's recommended. And so they're using this, this Python through a lot of their courses. So a lot of people, by the time they get to here, they already know some basic Python because they probably took the CS 101, which is one of their introductory courses, and that's all done using Python in the same sort of environment. Um, and then what, what they also do, um, is it is allows you to do uh, plotting and so forth with matplotlib. Um, so right here, uh, it's a problem where you're actually showing that if you uh, flip a coin 100 times, that actually generates a new statistic, and if you, if you do that over and over again and plant, plot that, um, you show that that generates a bell curve and so forth. Um, so when I run that, I'm actually seeing for n equals 1,000, you know, it starts to approximate a bell curve. Um, so I think this is very useful for, for uh, for these online courses, because this is not something you'd really see in a in a you know regular lecture. You'd have to go home and you know start up your computer and do this sorts of thing. So this lets you learn something about programming and learn something about um, you know and and do it right there as you're um, taking the class. Um, 
So just some recent developments. So this is, this is a field that's evolving pretty rapidly. Just some recent developments with Udacity. Um, they've now paired up with Pearson that will proctor the, the um, CS101 exam. Um, so th one of the problems is right now, if you take an exam, uh, you can retake it over and over again. Um, there's no, you know, checking to see, you know, are you cheating or whatever. If you have a, a separate testing center, then you've got some sort of uh, reliability that, hey, you actually took the exam, you, you didn't have, uh, you know, your friend helping you or whatever. So that's significant. Um, now Colorado State University is the first one accepting CS 101 um, for credit. So in other words, you could go to, to college at, at uh, Colorado State and you could take this online course and get credit. Obviously, you'd still have to test for it, but, but it gives you a lot of flexibility, you know, if you want to take that class. Um, and then Professor Thrun is, is now creating, you know, statistical um, 101 version 2. Um, so what's that? Why would he, why would he be, what was wrong with version 1? Well, it's very interesting. Um, Professor Thrun, so a little background about this guy. He's a Google fellow. Um, he's a, a researcher at Stanford, and he's one of the guys who created the robotic car. So obviously, he's got a lot of, you know, credentials in, in academia and research. And he created this, this, this statistics course. He did the statistics course. You know, other professors did these other courses. Well, as it turns out, he got some criticism about the quality of the course. Um, in particular, um, there was a, a, a guy who does, uh, um, he does like remedial statistics in New York. He wrote in his blog, he went through the whole course and he picked out stuff that he thought that, that was bad and he said, well, this is really a crappy product. And, and, some, of the th and some of the things were actually legit. For example, in the statistics course, you know, if you're doing statistics, you really have to define, are you talking about the population, are you talking about the sample? Um, you have to lay out your definitions very carefully. He didn't really do that, so there were some legitimate points there about the quality. Um, so to me, there's two takeaways from that. Number one is, you can be the best, you know, researcher in the world, you could be the best, uh, you know, the smartest guy in the world, that doesn't mean you can just go and, and make a good lecture, it takes a lot of work. You know, it takes a lot of work. Um, and to his credit, you know, he's going to go back and redo that course based on the feedback. But the other thing to me that's even more important is, um, so if he had given this lecture in a class, there would be a few kids who said, well, that, that sucked. You know, I didn't get that, what he was talking about. And maybe they'd raise their hand or maybe they wouldn't. But nobody else would know about it. When he put this course out there, the entire world can look at that course and evaluate it. And you can have a professor who spent, you know, 15 years teaching statistics and give feedback on it. So that's very valuable um, in terms of, you know, increasing the quality that you're, it's a lot harder to get that, you know, in a classroom. You know, I know professors go in and audit their, their peers' uh, courses and, and students give feedback it's not like this. It's not where everybody in the world can look at this. Um, so it, it really is almost like an open source pro product where everybody can look at it. So to me, that's, that's s a significant compared to, you know, the regular courses is you could get something that, uh, you know, has a, a much higher level of quality, you know, in theory, as it goes through these revisions. Um, let's see. Okay, so I thought it was interesting that they chose Python both for, for both of these um, uh, universities. Um, and I think it's worthwhile, since this is a Python conference, that we look at that and say, why did they do that? You know, because that's, obviously, if you have all these people taking these uh, courses and they're using Python, that's going to add greatly to the number of people that now know Python. Um, so that's very important. Um, one of the guys at Udacity put a blog about why uh, 
why they chose Python. He just kind of got went into this kind of, you know, nerd's approach of contrasting with C and saying, hey, you know, it really it's favorable to C. It's easy, easy. Uh, sorry, C, C sharp. It's easy to jump between C sharp and Python. You know, um, you got the flexible typing and all that. I don't think that's as important as a couple other things I'm going to talk about. Um, so the one of the big advantages of Python is it focuses on being readable. Um, so when you have a language that you know that you can just sit down and it's easy to understand and there's not a lot of tricks involved, um, that's very important when you want to address a large audience. Um, so that's one big advantage that that I think Python has that some other languages don't have. Um, the other thing is it's a general purpose scripting language, so it's not trying to, you know, be the perfect solution to a single problem. It's trying to, you're supposed to be able to address a lot of different problems with it. So just to compare it with a couple other languages um, that I've uh, dabbled in, so Python is not Haskell. So, you know, a couple years back I thought, I really want to learn Haskell, and I'm going to figure out what a, a monad is, you know. And so I printed out a bunch of stuff, and I studied and everything. And I probably, you know, at some point, you know, at 1 a.m., I figured out what it was, and I was able to use it. But I'm never going to use that in day to day. You know, it's a beautiful language, but uh, f most, you know, 99% of the time, you just don't need that level of power. Um, another example, Python is not Java. So Java has this philosophy of building everything about from, from objects. Um, and, and the idea that you can, everything can be represented as an object and you can take them apart and put them together. Um, so I have a five-year-old who buys these Lego things where you can build a robot or a car. And he'll look at it and he'll, he'll say, well, sometimes he'll build a robot, sometimes he'll build a car. But he never, if he builds a robot, he never takes it apart again and builds a car, okay? If he builds a robot, it's going to be a robot. So Java sort of went down the path of saying everything is an object. It's just not really how we represent things because a lot of times you're only worried about the functionality. You know, you don't care if a cat and a dog subclass from an animal. It's just not useful. Um, so, uh, and I make my living as, as a Java program, by the way. Um, so I can say that. Okay, Python is not C. Obviously, if you're programming the Linux kernel, you want to be as fast as possible. Um, and Python is not, you know, as fast as C, obviously, but it's it's fast enough 99% of the time to do what you need to do. And there's a trade-off, obviously. If you took this out on, on IH35 or something for your daily commute, um, it wouldn't be a pleasant experience. Um, so Python is really focused on, you know, being the, the best tool for 99% of the cases. Um, and obviously, now that we have big, you know, these mega sites like uh, uh, Reddit and some of these things, built in Python, it shows that Python is fast enough to do the job. Um, so, so to me, it's not, it's not so much the technical aspects of the language, it's the philosophy of Python. Um, so it focuses on readability. You know, it, it says there's one preferred way to do something, um, and then it focuses on production productivity. Um, and that's, these things are not easy to do because if you're a technical person it would, and you were designing a language, it would be very tempting to throw in a lot of bells and whistles or, or a lot of things that, you, you know, from your personal view, that's the way we should do it. Um, so it's, it's actually very difficult to come up with a language that has this broad appeal. Um, and it focuses on, on productivity. Um, so one, one example of that is, is PEP8. So, so PEP8 says this is how Python gets formatted. It's in a standard way, okay? 
You don't have to follow it, but most people do. So if I get a piece of Python code, I pretty much know it's going to be identi you know, it's going to have certain indentations, you know, it's going to have certain naming conventions. Um, whereas with Java, the way you decide that stuff is you bring all your developers in the room and then you argue about it for a couple hours um, and you do that on every project unless you have some standards. And that's time that's never going to come back, okay? Just from personal experience. So, um, and, and I had a friend who said, you know, I don't like how Python makes me indent stuff. You know, why should it tie my hands? Is that really what you're being paid for to figure out how to indent your code? You know, it's just not important. So, so the feeling it, to me is that Python is becoming the lingua franca of, of computer languages. And that means, you know, it's a bridge language. So if you know a language and I know a language, I don't necessarily want to learn your language to, to talk about, you know, algorithms, but if we both know, you know, the same, if we both know Python, then we can talk. Um, so I think it's becoming useful in that respect. Um, but what's the other big thing I think is important about Python? Um, you know, is it, is it generators? Is it uh, list comprehensions? Um, you know, here's, here's what I think is, is the most important. It's, it's a Python community. So the Python community, um, you know, I've experienced it personally. The reason I've involved in Python is because of the community. You know, I feel that it's got a better community out there than a lot of uh, other languages. Um, so the Python community ca crosses a lot of domains. Um, you have people doing Python, you know, in science, in business, uh, in mathematics, you know, it, at, on, at businesses, at universities, all over the place. Um, that's very, you know, uh, that's very useful compared to a more specialized language like R. Um, it's never going to have, uh, it's never going to be, be used for system programming. You're not going to use R for system programming. So you're going to have, you know, at a, at a convention like this, you're going to have, you know, Unix geeks coming in. You're going to have people from NASA coming in. I mean, you meet all kinds of people. You're not going to have that with these other languages. Um, and one good example is the Austin, Austin Python users group. Um, they have something like 400 members, okay? They got sponsors from, from multiple businesses. Um, it's one of the, you know, if, if you want to see how to do a meetup, um, you know, and, and you want to start a meetup, that's the one to look to because obviously they're doing it right. Um, that's just one example. Um, another thing about Python, it has a strong foothold in the university realm. So you'll see people doing Python in their research papers and things like that. Um, you don't see that as much in some other languages like Ruby. Ruby's a perfectly fine language. It's just as good as Python technically, but it doesn't have the same foothold in the universities that, that Python does. Um, it's a, it's a, gives you high quality software for free. So contrast that with something like Mathematica or Maple or something like that. They also, they're, they're very good software, but you're gonna pay um, a bunch of money for it. So why would you wanna learn something if you're a student in the university, why would you wanna learn Mathematica if after you leave the university, you've gotta pay a bunch of money to get it? Um, wouldn't you rather learn something that basically have the same capabilities that you can use later on? Um, there's not as many language bigots in the Python community. So if you've messed around with technology um, for a while, you have found out that there's a few what I call language bigots, which basically says, hey, my language is better than your language or my technology is better than your language or my iPhone is better than your language or your iPhone. Um, I'm sure you've had these discussions. Um, you don't see that as much in the Python community. And some people said, hey, maybe Python should push 
their agenda a little harder. Um, you know, like some other languages have, I don't think they've done it that much, but I, but it seems like it's working out because I think that that's, you know, frankly, it's irritating um, to hear technical arguments about a language. Um, so these are some of the reasons why I think Python has taken off. And obviously, if it really takes off, you know, in the setting of these online universities, it's going to have a big, you know, acceptance and it's really going to add, you know, to, to the, uh, to the number of people who, who speak Python. Um, okay. I want to diverge a little bit and, and talk about why education is important. It seems, you know, seems like it should be, it's one of those things where you're always told, why is education important? Um, but, you know, when you ask yourself that, it's not quite obvious, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll give you a couple examples in, in a bit. Um, so is it because, you know, technology is changing so quickly and we need to keep up and so forth? Um, I don't really believe that. Um, I don't believe technology is really changing that quickly. So if you, I actually believe that the rate of change of technology is actually decreasing. So if you, if you look at, if you would plot innovation over time, you know, per year in various fields, you would see that, you know, in the past 30 years, we're actually, the rate of change of technology is actually decreasing. So, you know, you, you look at things like the, the internal combustion engine. You know, the big innovation there was probably fuel injection. Well, that was like 25 years ago, okay? We're still flying the same jet planes we always did, you know. Um, Computers are smaller, but they're basically the same. The stuff I learned about programming, you know, 20 years ago, I still use today, okay? Spreadsheets and everything, you know, when we were using VisiCalc, um, it's the same spreadsheet today. It's a little bit more advanced, but that's not innovation, okay? Innovation uh, is something that's novel or new. So, you know, that's true that, that that you do need to keep up with technology, but that's not really why fundamentally education is important. Okay, you need an education to get a better paying or more fulfilling job. Um, well, yeah, that's true to a point, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, the number one thing if you want a good paying job is choose the right career, okay? If you, if you wanna make money, you gotta choose the career to do that, you know? Um, if, you know, choose a career that has that earning potential. That's probably more important. If you want to get a well-paying job, you've got to have the interviewing skills, okay? And the communication skills. Honestly, that's more important than your education, okay? So, uh, so these things, when you look at it, they're not as important as you might think. Okay, once you have a job, is, is it b important to perform well? Is, is education important with that? Well, that's where it really pays off, okay? And that's why I've seen that people with maybe lacking in certain aspects of their education, they don't do as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so just from my own experience. Uh, so obviously if you're doing a software project, you wanna put some analysis into it to make sure, is this a software you really need? Are you paying the, the correct amount for it? You know, uh, you need to do a risk analysis, you need to do a cost benefit analysis, and you need to put some numbers into that. So, um, one contract I was on for a while, a while back, you know, this was for the government, it was America's Job Bank, um, big team of developers, um, working between um, groups in a couple different states. They worked on it for, for close to a year, easily spent a um, million dollars and threw it all away. So that's just, that's just waste. Another example, when I was at Texas Mutual Insurance, um, they decided they wanted to rewrite their whole, you know, uh, insurance system and they had a couple big architects there 
who told them this is how it should be done and this is going to be, you know. So that's something where, again, a project that went on for the better part of the year, um, more than a million dollars, they decided when it was done, you know, this doesn't fit our needs, they threw it all away, okay? So how do I come up with a million dollars? Well, if you bring in four developers, you know, as consultants, you're billing them out, obviously, at, you know, 100 bucks an hour. Um, you do that for a year, that's $800,000 by itself. Then you have several staff on top of that. Um, so there's a million dollars right there. Then you have the overhead, which I'm not even factoring in. So if you just, if you do these sorts of projects without doing any sort of analysis beforehand, um, if you just have an architect come in and say, hey, this is, this is gonna be great, and you buy that, obviously you're not gonna get a good result. Um, another example is when I worked at the controller. Um, and some of that I can't even talk about because it's a little bit sensitive, but just one example. Um, we spent uh, over a million dollars on what? On stamps. So we had to send out notifications to half the people in Texas that we exposed their social security numbers. Um, and, and I'm sure you've read about this in the paper. Um, so when you have a security environment like that, you have to look at your environment, you have to look at your risks. Whenever you're looking at risks, those are probabilities, okay? You have to do a cost-benefit analysis to find out how do I reduce this risk so that that's cost-effective, okay? If you don't do those sorts of things, um, then you're just gonna be reacting. Then you're just gonna say, hey, this happened, now what are we gonna do? After that, it's too late. Um, Another example that I think is even bigger is, uh, uh, you know, the way we allocate money, you know, in our government. Um, so just, just an example, I just looked this up, um, looking at distributing money, for example, for uh, energy research. Um, over the last 10 years, we spent about $40 billion doing that. Um, maybe 14 billion was on um, energy efficiency and renewables. Um, contrast that with the war on terror where we spent um, about 1.5 trillion dollars. And those are direct costs, those aren't, you know, uh, that's not, in other words, that's not defense spending, that's just going over to Iraq and Afghanistan and things like that. Well, what's the problem there? Well, the problem is, those are all risks that you know have to be analyzed and there's a cost benefit analysis that goes along with that. So the question is, are you spending your money effectively? Now some people might say, well, you can't really measure you know, things like you know, risk and you, you can't measure these things, you just have to have a gut uh, feeling for them. Well, obviously that's not true, right? Because uh, for example, in our financial markets, we do that all the time, right? I mean, I have a friend who, who just because he's a programmer in one of these finance firms, you know, he's pulling down a couple hundred thousand a year. Um, he's just a programmer. Um, but the fact of the matter is, they have models that, that work on the financial markets, and your, and your portfolio, you know, if the stock market goes down, your portfolio is gonna go down. But these guys make money either way. So they figured out the system, they have algorithms. In fact, we actually call them quants because they quantify that information. So they're able to quantify the way the stock market behaves, right? So obviously if we want to, we can build models to represent these systems even if they're highly complex, even if they're highly variable, right? Another example is the weather, right? I mean, imagine if we, if we predicted the weather, um, the way we, we allocate funds for the government. We basically just asked 100 people, you know, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? And that would be, you know, our prediction. But obviously that's not very effective. Um, and obviously the way our money gets distributed is not really 
political in the sense that it's not based on Republicans versus Democrats. If you look at the way our money is distributed, you know, they argue about a lot of trivial things, but in general, they're coming up with the same solutions. A lot of the solutions do not take into account the risk. Um, so why is that? Well, the reason that is is because um, analytical thought and being able to analyze a lot of information is not intuitive. And this is something um, that I'm well aware of myself because, um, because I'm of average intelligence, okay? I found that out, you know, quite some time ago. So I'm, probably a lot of people here are, are, are smarter than, than me. The only reason I was able to be successful in what I do is because I trained myself, you know, and I worked, you know, very hard to learn stuff, um, but it's not because I immediately, when I, when I was uh, started out, because I understood things. You know, I took one programming course in college and I flunked it and had to take it again. Um, so I didn't have any natural ability. Um, but that's true for a lot of people. You're not gonna know how to make good decisions just left to your own devices, okay? That's something you should be learning in school. And you should be learning how to apply that in various situations I just don't believe it's happening like it should be, okay? Um, and we're kind of being told that these new technologies will help us do that, you know? That because we all have smartphones, we're gonna somehow be smarter. Smartphones don't make you smart, okay? Having more information is just the first step, but you have to know how to apply that information. So obviously for, for a lot of us, I'm sure there's a lot of people in there, you've probably trained yourself, okay? A lot of what people that come to these conferences, they've trained themselves. Um, they've done a lot of work on their own um, because a lot of times you can't get that from the educational system. Um, you know, at least that's been my experience. I have a five-year-old now who we're, we're trying to make sure that he gets a good uh, education. It's not easy, okay? So why do I think uh, this online deal is important? Um, well, if you look at traditional education, it's kind of structured wrong. So here's, here's what you do when usually when you're a kid, you sit around, um, you know, if this is how the, this is how the sort of the, the default system s set up. You sit around, you know, watching Wiggles and Barney and stuff like that till you're maybe like five. Then you go off to kindergarten and you sit in a classroom with a bunch of other kids and the teacher talks about stuff, you know, and you do some exercises. You're all there in your chairs and everything. Um, and you learn some stuff. Um, some of it's good and some of it's just, you know, indoctrinated with a bunch of facts. And you're not really taught how to tie that stuff together, you know. A lot of it is just indoctrination. And obviously there's some teachers that will help tie those things together, but, um, but that's more work. To be honest, it's harder to be a teacher um, to, that, that wants to go the extra mile and tie things together. Um, it's easier to just present things um, and, and sort of feed it to, to your students. Um, it's very difficult to give individual instruction to students. Um, if you're in fifth grade, you're with a bunch of other kids in fifth grade and you're treated exactly the same, okay? You're not always shown how to solve problems in the real world. So you're shown these idealized problems, right? It's just like in physics, you know, you're always solving the same problem for a sphere, right? And what if it's not a sphere? Okay, then you've got to approximate things. Well, a lot of times they don't show that part. Um, they seem to shy away from exposing young kids to mathematics, like it's gonna damage their brain. Um, not just, and I'm not talking about doing calculus, I'm just talking about you know, getting comfortable with numbers, okay? Getting comfortable with quantifying things, getting comfortable with measuring things. Um, there's not enough 
there's not a strong enough feedback loop in existing teaching. So in other words, if, if you're having problems in school, um, chances are uh, nobody's going to pick up on it. Nobody's going to say, hey, if you're struggling on this particular concept, well, why don't you look at it this way, okay? Why don't you flip it around and look at this way? Um, so you're, you're going to struggle with that, and eventually you might figure it out. Um, but if you don't, you know, that's just tough, okay? You're going to be left behind. Um, and you're still going to get through the system, okay? You're not going to be weeded out through the system. You're still going to get through, but you're going to be lacking, okay? And you're going to have to fill that in later. Um, so so the, the idea of um, online education, that could help fill some of these gaps, okay? Because you're getting feedback on how well you figured things out and you're getting it immediately. Um, it could be structured for your particular skills, for your strengths and weaknesses. Now, I don't think it's there yet. I think it's got a long way to go. But imagine if the software was figuring out, you know, this is the area you have problems in. And here's some other problems that help to illustrate the concepts for you. Imagine how much more quickly you could progress. Um, and the other thing about the, the online uh, education is, um, yeah, I took a bunch of uh, courses when I was in college. I forgot all that stuff. Do you really expect me to remember that stuff you know, for, for 20 years, okay? You're not gonna remember that stuff for 20 years, it's ridiculous. So how are you gonna go uh, refresh yourself on these concepts? You still, if you needed those concepts 20 years ago, you still need them even more today. I mean, the, pro the decisions we, that we have to make today are more complicated because there's more information. It's not that the technology is so much more different, but there is more information, the problems are more complex, Okay, and we know more things now that we have to take into account. Okay, so, and that's the reason I chose statistics because even though you know I, I got a little bit of statistics back in college, I don't remember any of it. I mean, I hardly remember any of that statistics. Um, so this lets somebody who's who maybe they're you know a single mom or maybe they're you know a guy who who you know work 60 hours a week, you know, doing some dead end job, but he wants to learn a little bit more about something. Now there's an opportunity to do that that's a little bit more structured than just going to Wikipedia. Um, so that's, to me, that's a big thing. Um, that's a big advantage. Um, so, okay, so, just to summarize a little bit about why this is important um, for, for people in the Python community, okay? So everybody here is part of this Python community, um, and why is that important, okay? So number one, having the uh, you know, open source software available, um, having it out there, having people use it is you know, it's essential to the educational community, okay? And, and, and it's not just software, okay? So some people think, hey, if you don't write software, you know, you're, you're not really contributing. Um, a lot of times the documentation is just as important, if not more important than the software. Do you know how many great um, pieces of software um, are out there but they never um, got used because nobody understands how to use them. You know, they don't have good documentation. Um, they don't have good, you know, teaching. They don't have people to show you how it works. Um, so if you're, if you're part of this community, any way you can contribute is valuable. And you shouldn't feel like, hey, I can't write code or, you know. If you file a bug report, that's a contribution. That's really what makes software better is the bug reports, okay? Just like in writing a book, it's not just the author that makes it a good book, it's the editor. You know, if you don't have a good editor, then you've got a problem because you may think your stuff is, you know, you, you may think you're William Shakespeare, but chances are you're probably not. And if you're trying to reach a large audience, you know, it's not good enough to 
to just write code and then just write some documentation as an afterthought. Um, so I think all these things are important. Um, we should act as ambassadors, am ambassadors for Python. So what I mean by that is um, you know, when you talk to people, my opinion is you should have this philosophy of um, uh, kind of building bridges, okay? So if you're talking to some, someone about Python, you don't want to go in there and say, well, it's, you know, it's a superior language for this or that or this. You want to look at, you know, how do I solve your problem? Okay, what are you trying to accomplish and how do I make it, you know, better? Um, and I think Python is already, you know, the community is already doing that and that's why it's effective, okay? Um, and then, uh, finally, I think we need more, you know, we need more Python and we need less Angry Birds. So what I mean by that is, you know, I, uh, I have a five-year-old now, um, like I said, and every night I have to tell him a story. And he plays Angry Birds on my wife's uh, iPod every day. Not every day, but he does it quite frequently. And so I have to tell him this story, you know, I have to make up a story every single night about, you know, the angry birds and the pigs and, you know, wh why they're at war. It's really, it's really st a strain after a while because, you know, the story just, it has to go on and on. And, you know, they're, they're opening these portals underground where the pigs live and there's these, they have to find, and they go to other planets. I mean, it just, it's incredible. But it's, but what's interesting is he's so fascinated by these, um, by these birds, right? And it's just, it's just a game. To me, it's just a time waster. But, but I have to take it seriously because that's something that he's interested in. So I'm not gonna give him, you know, a crappy story. I gotta, I gotta spend, you know, 15 minutes a day just thinking, what am I gonna talk about tonight? Um, and I've gotta come up with something good. Now I've gotta have a cliffhanger at the end so that he'll, he'll be asking tomorrow night. Um, but, but I was thinking, you know, tho those are characters, and, 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 you know, I would like to see that, that kids be just as interested and just to, as compelled to learn about um, the things that will really have an impact in their world, you know, as they're growing up, you know. And I, and I would like them to have, you know, some of the same heroes that I had growing up, which were, you know, some of the legends in, in, you know, science and math and business and so forth, people that gave us all these great inventions, you know, I don't want him to be lost in the world of, uh, you, you know, I, I want him to have some grounding in reality. Um, so that's, so, so that's kind of my slant on, on presenting this is, you know, we are very interested in the technology for technology's sake. We are very interested in having, you know, the latest iPhone and so forth. But we also have to remember how this ties into the later, the bigger world. We don't want to think, you know, hey, I'm just in this bubble, okay? And and what goes on in the rest of the world doesn't matter, you know. In in my opinion, people that have created, uh, you know. Uh, you know, Van Rossen and, and somebody like that who created Python, you know, he, he gave a, a big contribution to the world. Um, that, that's very important. Uh, so, and, and there's a lot of individuals like that coming together to do this. Um, so I think it's important that, you know, as we, as we get, as we bear ourselves in the technology, take time to step back and say, you know, What's, what's the big picture here? You know, what are we really trying to do move forward? Um, you know, how do we advance, you know, our, our you know, ha as we're building this, this piece of code, you know, keeping in mind there is something bigger going on here, you know. It has a big impact and we don't always realize it. Um, so, uh, 
that pretty much concludes uh, what I wanted to talk about. So thank you very much. <laughs>